And to this day, I am concerned about those young people. I, I wonder what is happening to those young men. I remember talking to one young man. The gun in his hand was larger than he was. He was short. And I said to him, how old are you? And he looked at me and he lied. He said 17. I don't think he was more than 14 or 15 years old. Really? Because when they went down to Mokorapa Road, they were not only given shelter and food. At one point, they were pay, being paid a $50 allowance per week. I was told that by one of the Muslim men. They were given a faith, the Muslim faith. They were encouraged to get married. They so it would stabilize their lives and so on. So in fact, they found themselves in a kind of haven. And I was really, I mean, my heart went out to those young men. I don't think they had a clue what they were getting themselves involved in. And I wonder what is happening to those people, young people like that in Trinidad today. What kind of service is the government or community organization providing for them? I think Baka sought personal power. I think this is what he wanted. He probably saw himself as an Ayatollah, like you have in Iran. That's, that's my perception. Let me see. One of, the, one of the young gunmen said to us, we are going to create an Islamic state, yes. which I considered an act of insanity. I mean, I couldn't see how you could have an Islamic state in a country like Trinidad and Tobago. I have a perception of Baka that has to do with carnival and masquerade. I think there's an element of fantasy in this guy's psychology. And that he, it's quite like he perceived himself as some kind of Ayatollah. And that um, he probably thought that if he tried to introduce a, an Islamic state in Trinidad, he would be successful. Completely ignoring the fact that there's a large Christian and Hindu population in this country. Although I suppose in, in that event he would probably have brought them under the gun. But I detect an element of masquerade and the wearing of the gong and the, and the fez and all that. I, I, there's a bit of a carnival, carnivalesque, burlesque kind of aspect of his personality that I... As I said in my book, when we... When the army had agreed to, that they were going to... They, they said they would release the hostages and so on, he turned to us and invited us to come to dinner at Mokorapa Road. And I said, this man is insane. I mean, you hold people hostage have them terrified under the point of gunfire and so on. You turn around and invite me to come to your, your, your mosque for dinner. I mean, and he said it in such a way that we should jump up and say, well, thank you very much and, and accept it. That has, to be, that has to be a form of insanity, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but that's my perception. Having distributed those guns on the Friday afternoon, Baka was expecting that a lot of other civilians, non muslim members, would join in his insurrection. And I think he was terribly disappointed that that didn't happen. From, from your perspective as a journalist, who I, I believe most journalists will have the air on the ground kind of thing, um, was that a realistic expectation? I don't think so. You don't think so? But I don't think that Baka is a realistic person. I see. I think he's a fantasist. I see. I was told by Loris Barak on the Friday afternoon, on the Friday evening, that on the Friday afternoon prior to the assault on the Red House and TDT... That would be the previous Friday? No, the same Friday, the July same 27th. Friday, yes. They had driven around several van loads of guns, which they distributed in places like Mova, Belmont, Beatham Gardens, Laventil, and so on. They had distributed these guns all over expecting that when they announced the coup, these guys who had the guns would come in to join them. But that never happened. Abu Bakr was the recipient of, I think, some $2.5 million in compensation for damage to his property, which alarmed me. None of the TTT hostages were ever compensated in any way. I had to seek medical treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder after the coup. There's a young lady here who was one of my doctors at the time taking antidepressant pills and so on, all of which I paid out, out of my own pocket. And I am really, I mean, a man who commits insurrection, who holds a prime minister hostage, is awarded $2.5 million. That's extraordinary. Um, were you concerned for your life 
during the insurrection? I was absolutely certain I'd be killed. Mm -hmm. There's no question of that in my mind. I'm not surprised at that. My perspective in the country has certainly changed. I am, um, I seldom go out in public. I'm very wary of being among strangers. I, um, I'm not the same person I was prior to 1990. I'm very much more cautious, always anticipating some kind of trouble. I don't interact with my fellow citizens as easily as I used to before. I'm very, I'm very suspicious of people. I'm always anticipating some kind of attack or assault. I'm aware of that. I'm very conscious of that. I don't know that I've entirely recovered. There's a perception apparently among our politicians that the Jamaat has a lot of popular grounding, that they have a lot of, you know, that they can muster votes which is why no doubt the politicians continue to play games with them. Every year on the anniversary of July 27th, the Jamaat puts up a banner outside on its wall commemorating the events of 1990. They have never apologized. They have never expressed any remorse. They have never given any indication that what they did was wrong. As a matter of fact, from what you hear from some of them, some of the evidence I've heard here, as far as they're concerned, they were absolutely right to do what they did. So to my mind, there has been no change in that mentality in the 20 years gone. If you were commemorating an event that I regard as treasonous and as a criminal act, then you haven't, you, you haven't in any way been reformed or feel any remorse for what you've done. And one gets the impression to that people have either lost interest or they don't believe anything will come out of this commission. As far as they're concerned, it's a waste of time and money. I mean, the insurgents are free, and I don't see that changing. And as far as some people are concerned, let's bury it, let's forget it, you know, let's just let's, let's write it off. That's the perception that I, I, I detect among some people. Why are you bothering to go through all that rubbish now, you know, it's all over? and so on. It's not my view. I'm just reporting what I've heard. 